Hello everyone, the summer version of Bucks Talk is once again up and running at BucksHockey.com. I'm Scott Montesano, welcoming you and thanking you for taking time to pull us up on the internet listing. It's been two weeks of hazy, hot, and humid weather. The sort of weather where it's just warmer than the inside of a cherry pie. The sort of temps that... Stew up the old man gravy on the back of your knee. The sort of day where you feel like you are living inside of a freshly baked cinnamon roll. Surely not the time of the year when hockey is prevalent, but it is the time of the season when the seeds of the next campaign are sown. So just like any road trip, you fill up the gas tank, you check the wipers, you make sure the car is in tip-top shape before you hit the highway because once you're on the road that maintenance is well tough to near impossible to do and that is what every hockey organization is doing right now they're checking the wipers they're checking the air pressure they're maybe replacing a couple of tires they're doing all that right now before the season gets going another 30 minute program is coming up this week with a few topics to cover, namely the release of the USHL schedule. And coming up in just a second, we'll talk with the Buccaneers' Brant Perriott concerning how the schedule was designed this season. We're not going to go through a 60-game schedule and W and L it, as the sports jock nerds like to call it. We're not going to go through and analyze every bit of the schedule, but we're going to give you an inside peek as to how that schedule was made. Uh, many of you out there have opinions. A lot of people think it's a good schedule for the Buccaneers, and quite frankly, that is the that is what it was, a very good schedule. But you, a lot of people don't know how a schedule is put together, and we'll have Brant Perry out tell us how it was done this year. Also, there is some sawdust floating around the arena, and we'll tell you why. So all of that coming up in just a little bit. But of course, the big news with the Des Moines Buccaneers is the arrival of the newest fan of the Des Moines Buccaneers. Of course, the birth of my child, finally, finally, I was able to squeeze out, well, more, more accurately, my wife was able to squeeze out our first child last Saturday, July 23rd, a boy, a baby boy named Derek, Derek Rocco Montesano weighing in at a beefy 8 pounds, 6 ounces. I'm already telling Reg that I expect him to be one of the defensemen for the Buccaneers in about 16 seasons. A beefy young lad, but both Derek and my wife Angela doing fantastic a week after the fact. It was a, a magical night last Saturday. In fact, I was downtown at a sporting event. When the, the missus gave me a call, I got a call at 6.30. I was downtown at a sporting event with uh, Brant Perriott from the Buccaneers and one of our new interns, and I got the call and went about 85 miles an hour on 2.35 to get back to where we live and then pick her up, bring her to the hospital. When all was said and done, all these stories of 16-hour labors, 24-hour labors, took my wife just three hours to pop that kid out. So, again, congratulations to my wife and to our newborn son. And, of course, I'll take all of the credit uh, for that. You'll have a chance to meet young Derek Rocco Montesano at an upcoming home game this season. Of course, like every young baby, the baby doesn't cry in the hospital. And as soon as we get him home, the waterworks start to shed. But he has taken after his, his old man. You can tell he likes to eat a lot, and you can tell that he likes to work with his mouth. He's constantly putting his, his hands in his mouth, and that's usually a sign of somebody who likes to use their mouth. So I'm anticipating young Derek is going to be a babbler in just a, a little bit. One thing I am for certain, though, and I'm not going to go into details about it, I do believe cherry pie has been ruined for the rest of my life. Uh, I've seen images that reminded me of a cherry pie exploding in a microwave. I will leave it. Add that. Of course, the schedule being released is probably the next big story, and some would argue the big story for the Buccaneers in the last few days. Great schedule for the Des Moines Bucks. If you found this show on the internet, I'm positive you have found the schedule by now. The schedule is out there 60 games, 30 home, 30 away, 
fantastic schedule for the Buccaneers. There's no punter games, as we call it in the business. There's no random Tuesday or Wednesday night in January or February. The sort of games that you just don't draw. And while we do have some fans who, they love those games. Those are the people who work on the weekends. And there are people who work legitimate businesses on the weekends who have a hard time making it out to some of the Buccaneer games, and they like those midweek games. Well, unfortunately, it, that's not the majority. This year's schedule does not have any punter games. The Buccaneers have one Wednesday, and that's Thanksgiving Eve, the long-awaited return of the once-annual Thanksgiving Eve game. It'll be against Omaha. That will be a lot of fun. And the other non-Friday, Saturday home game is the Sunday before President's Day in February, which is going to be an afternoon game against Waterloo at home. And we're going to be making some announcements in the uh, coming up towards the end of August, early September, when we release the promotional schedule that are going to let you know that's going to be a big night. Uh, we're going to tie that in with another event going on at the arena that day. And that could be one of our largest crowds of the season coming up on that Sunday. So a great schedule. The schedule was delayed. And there's no mincing words about it. It, it, it came out later than anybody wants to. And for you, the fans, you want to see the schedule. Some of you want to plan some road trips. You don't care about how, how you don't care about selling the games. You don't care about getting the group tickets out there. You're not as concerned about that because because that's not that's not your job, and you shouldn't be concerned about that. That's our job. It's our job to go out there and sell the tickets and to skip the group tickets and to sell more sponsorships. That's our job. The the later schedule really puts a monkey wrench into some of those plans for teams. But for fans, and the key thing is always the fans, the biggest hassle for all of you was maybe planning a road trip and simply knowing when the games are. You want to know when those games are. And I think a lot of people would have liked to have seen that schedule out about a month earlier. And with all honesty, the schedule was about 90% completed as of a month ago. So you're asking, what took so long? We kept seeing on the Internet, whether it was you, Scott, or other USHL media sources saying, a ah, schedule is going to come out tomorrow, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. And we did that for a full week. And the reason why the schedule, you had a hard time getting to the finalized schedule was that everyone was fighting for perfection. Everybody in the league was fighting for perfection, and rightly so. Brant Perriott will explain in just a second how the schedule was done this season. And the way the schedule was done this season was basically without a third-party intermediary. What you had was every team sitting around in a, in a round table, if you will, whether actually in person, as was the case with one meeting, or over the phone and on the Internet, but everybody pounding the table for the betterment of their own organization, and rightly so. And you can't say one team deserves something more than another team. And you can't say another team deserves something more than another team. Every team is on equal footing. And that was the situation for you parents out there. And, of course, I'm a new parent myself. But for you parents out there who have multiple children and everybody's trying to decide where's the family going to go out to eat, maybe your son wants one thing and your daughter wants another. Well, your son's wishes aren't any more important than your daughter's wishes and vice versa. And that's where the issues came in. You had some some picking and choosing over certain dates. Teams wanted to get moved into certain dates. So that was the issue. Finishing it off, getting everything perfect, that was the issue finalizing the schedule in the final month. That's why it took so long to get that final step done. In the future, what I'd like to see is the league have that objective third party to come in and put the foot down. Take some emotion out of it. In my opinion, it's better to have 16 teams that are pleased than 10 teams that are ecstatic and 6 that are upset. Now, that's not necessarily the case with the schedule this season. That's not necessarily the case. I think a lot of teams, if not all of the teams, are very happy with the schedule 
as it came out this season, but you need to get that schedule out a couple weeks earlier than you did now because there are teams out there, and not the Buccaneers, who are having a very good time getting the group tickets out there. The team's been established for a long time. But some of these younger franchises, every day that schedule wasn't put out makes it even harder for them to sell those tickets, to plan those promotions throughout the course of their season. All that said, for the Buccaneers, great to see Omaha more, Sioux City more. You get to see the traditional rivalries more. For the Buccaneers also, unlike last season, they play a Western Conference schedule as a Western Conference team. So the Buccaneers will earn their spot in the standings this season. If they make the playoffs, it's because they beat the teams they had to. If they don't make the playoffs, it's not because of the out-of-town scoreboard. It's because they didn't take care of business. You're not going to be as dependent on the out-of-town scoreboard this season as you were last season. Unfortunately, last season, the Buccaneers could have won a few more games here and there. They could have played better against the Western Conference. But at the end of the day, Des Moines had to depend on that out-of-town schedule down the stretch and throughout the whole season. They had to depend on that out-of-town schedule. That will not be the case this year. The Buccaneers properly playing a Western Conference schedule. The downside is you don't get to see Muskegon as much as you did last season. Des Moines is putting together a preseason slate. Uh, Red Simon has locked down some dates. We'll be announcing the preseason slate in the next couple of weeks. But as we talk about the schedule, we talk about how the schedule was put together. The man from the Buccaneers who had his foot in the water when it came to producing the schedule was our very own Director of Business Development, Brant Perriott. And the first question I had for him was how excited was he to finally get this schedule done and be able to release it to the public? Well, very happy just to get this thing released. Obviously, I think our release date of what are we at, July 25th here or whatever, it's uh, probably later than we've ever been. I think that's a, that's a testament to the process that we use this season by making it a collective effort of all the the member clubs of the league to get together, put everybody in a room, and, and try to come with a new, more equitable way to do this this season. But in the end, we're happy to have it out, and I think Des Moines is very fortunate that we got a, a very good schedule this season. I think fans always want to know what goes into making a schedule. Does it just get thrown into a computer? Is there a, a scheduling czar in the league? And, of course, it depends on what season you're talking about and what league you're talking about, but how was it put together this season? Well, we, we took a different approach. In the past, we've used a computer system. As long as I've been doing this, uh, we've used a computer system where you submit available dates. And uh, the, the problem with the, the computer is it obviously it, it has more computing power to, to, to get the initial schedule put out, to, to get that out right away, don't waste any time. The problem is it ultimately has its flaws as well, where it'll put you in a, get day, a game where you, let's say, uh, you know, a Fargo on Friday, and you wind up in a in a Dubuque on Saturday. It just it, it doesn't have the the ability not to do that unless you tell it to. So, it ultimately we were sending teams west and east and leaving everything open. So we decided to go about it a different approach to sit everybody down, look at the schedule as a whole as a group, and start to place all the games individually. And you know, all the credit goes out to Joe McDonald from the USHL, who is kind of the uh, Let's just say that the the henchman here, the the guy that really organized all this and made it happen, and then the second guy to to, to thank is is Scotty Brand up there with the USHL as well. Those two were the the lead on this, and they they made the initial schedule, and then we all met as a group in Chicago over a 48 hour period to to start to take apart the parts that each individual team didn't like and start to replace things in it. You know, we, in, in theory, that, that idea sounds great. We we're excited to, to make it happen. But ultimately, what you find out is it's very difficult to, to, to finalize that, and it, that's what caused the eventual delay at the end. Some of the goals for the team going into the scheduling process, I think a lot of fans look at the schedule and they see vast changes over last season, obviously, over the last couple of seasons, more rivalry games and a uh, significant decrease in the amount of weekday games. 
yeah, I think that the diehard fans that come out to all of our games, well, they know that we do tend to have a, a little bit smaller attendance on those on those weeknight evenings if it's the Tuesday, the Wednesday night games. So one of the things with this schedule is it did reward the teams that had more availability of the arena. So you know, I went into this with an open book. I did, there were some games I really wanted, some games that I had to have. But ultimately, the only thing that we really wanted more than anything else was Friday and Saturday night home games. So having that building flexibility by by having an ownership group that does own this building, it allowed us to, to, to play some of those games. And I think that that's one thing that really I liked about this process is it rewarded those teams that, that had the flexibility and a little creativity with the, the way they wanted to put this thing together. That allowed us to have no no games that were, you know, the, the Monday through through Thursday this year except for the the night before Thanksgiving where we got Omaha and then the second part of that question you asked about the rivalry games we were able to place some emphasis on when we wanted to see those you know ultimately with the uh, with the computer scheduling this your close games your Waterloo's your Omaha's get dropped in last and those are where you're seeing uh, in even Cedar Rapids the games on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Wednesdays over the last five years always seem to be your Waterloo's and things like that because they're the last game to get dropped in with this process, it allowed us to place the Omaha games a little earlier. You know, you see Omaha the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, a, a date we're excited about. We've had success with in the past, and to, to get a rival in here on that evening is is great for us. Also, you know, traditionally, if you look back, that the best weekend of the year is January, the last Saturday in January. It's always a good date here. I think it's just the, you know, the holidays are over, the the football season's pretty much over, besides the Super Bowl. It's nice and cold outside. Hockey's in your mind, and to get Omaha on that Saturday night day, you know that was our pretty much our number one priority of a game we wanted and a weekend we wanted. So we'd like to see a rival in that, so the fans can can have a, a great show that evening. So I think we accomplished all our goals there. You pretty much did 99.999% of the schedule, so the success and the failure of this team probably rests on you. How much credit do you take for this whole uh, the the upcoming season? Well, <laughs> ultimately, if you don't have the players, you're probably not going to have the wins. But I think we've we've set the team up for the uh, in a position where we we don't have a lot of overly challenging games. And it, I, I feel for the Eastern Conference because of the or the the division, the, the way that it's set up and the way it's structured, they do have a a bigger challenge when they're scheduling. And the reason for that is. It, you look at the travel, the Youngstown travel is going to be, a, you know, a little more difficult for them. The, the trips to Indy and Ann Arbor, you know, those are those are longer trips. But ultimately, I don't even think it's the, the distance of the trip that made it so difficult. It's the having Team USA in that division ultimately causes some, some scheduling problems. And it's a great thing to have USA. It adds a lot of credibility to the league, and it's something we want to keep. But it's, it, it causes you to get kind of creative the way you do the schedule. And the reason why is we have an even amount of teams in the league, 16 teams. But when the Team USA has the 17s and the 18s that both play, usually they either play on the same night or they travel together on the same night, which ultimately leads to 17 teams in the league or 15 teams in the league, which in turn leads to one team that, that gets left out of the mix on any given Friday or Saturday night, which that's, that causes the challenges. That's why you'll see that the Saturday nights where the Bucks don't play, and then that ultimately pushes you back into a weekend where you would have played on a Saturday. Your only open date then is to come in on a Sunday. So I do feel for those teams in the East, but I know there's some, some great minds in that division. The, the folks with USA, Scott Monahan over there is just a, a great guy to work with. He was, he was very, very uh, helpful to all the teams, and with his help, I, I know that they – they made it equal for everybody, so I don't think that the success or failure of any one team this season is going to be placed on the schedule. And once again, that was Buccaneers Director of Business Development, Brant Perriott. Uh, Brant spent much of the last, well, much of the last couple of months working on the schedule from a Des Moines Buccaneers standpoint, and that schedule may still have some changes before the start of the season, but before you fans start to worry about some of the home games moving, uh, that's not the issue. There may be a couple of road games that get swished here and there, but nothing major, and as soon as anything, if anything happens, we would, of course, let you know at BucksHockey.com. In case you missed it earlier this week, we had it up on the website, 
at BucksHockey.com, and that is the fact that the old sawdust is swirling around the arena. Usually at this time of the season, all you are hearing are the, the ghostly echoes of the sound of hockey that are seeped into the walls of Buccaneer Arena like melted butter soaking into a, into a slice of Wonder Bread. Well, all that has been replaced by, again, the sound of hammers and power eyes, saws, and all of that. As the Buccaneers doing some work to their own locker room, the Bucks locker room getting a little bit of a modernization, if you will, getting a little bit of a renovation, and you're seeing some photos of it right here. The Buccaneers organization is updating the stalls that the players utilize throughout the course of the season. Now, Buccaneer Arena for the longest time had old-time stalls, those got replaced a couple of years ago by more of a bench-style seating. And now those are being replaced by, in essence, professionalized stalls. These are, these are not your old gym class stalls. This is a professionalized stall, just like they have in the NHL, just like they have at many Division I collegiate programs. The stall is, it is the lap of luxury in many ways. It features compartments. A couple of lock compartments so players could put away wallets, cell phones, iPods, things of that nature. They also have other compartments to put away equipment to maybe leave some shoes, to leave some extra knickknacks as well. So they can keep themselves organized throughout the course of the season. Again, individualized compartments. These lockers, these stalls, if you will, are basically exactly what you get at all of the higher higher levels. The renovations will be a nice perk to the players. It, it's one of those things, just a nice perk to the players, and one of another uh, one of a number of things that the Buccaneers organization is looking at doing this season, next season, and down the road as the renovations continue to take place at the uh, at the arena. I know a lot of fans. Uh, are wondering, you know, what renovations are going to take place, what renovations are going to go on, when are they going to go on, and what we can tell fans is they are in the works, and then that's not uh, that's not just trying to blow smoke. That really is the case. Renovations are in the works, but it does take time. It does take time. It does take patience to be able to put these renovations in order because you want them done right. That's the most important thing. You want them done right because when you do something along the lines of, of a renovation to a building 50-plus years, you don't anticipate having to do it again a couple of years later. When you do it, any sort of renovation, it may very well be the last time that area of the arena is touched for a long time. So you want to do it right, and that takes time, and it does take patience. And these locker room stalls are a nice step forward. That is an investment. That is an investment of time. That is an investment of money. And it is going to be a very nice perk for the players coming up when they arrive for training camp at the end of August and in early September. Also, if you missed it on the web a couple weeks ago, former Buccaneer Danny O'Donohue got a taste of the NHL life, if you will. Dan O'Donohue, who spent 40 games with the Buccaneers in 2009 and 2010. Uh, had a chance to skate at the Islanders prospect camp back in mid-July. Good for that kid. You know, Good for Danny O'Donohue. He was here back in 2009 uh, through the 2010 season. That one season was here through the end of January. Very nice kid. He's a reminder that a lot of these players who come to the Des Moines Buccaneers and to the USHL are in fact still kids. We forget they're 17, 18, 19 years old. They're still kids. They're growing up. They're young men, but they're still kids. And for many of them, they're moving away from home for the first time. They're getting to experience life away from home. And it was a good experience for Dan O'Donoghue out here in Des Moines. He got a chance to be away from family and friends. He's from the metro New York area. And what he learned out here and the growth that he had out here allowed him to parlay that into a Division I opportunity in Erie, Pennsylvania at Mercyhurst College and then take that opportunity and parlay that into an opportunity to gain some interest from the New York Islanders. So congratulations to Dan O'Donoghue and 
hopefully he's able to turn that from a one-time visit to the prospect camp into maybe some actual interest from the New York Islanders as he moves up through the uh, collegiate ranks. Also, we don't know much about this young man yet. Uh, the fans don't. You haven't really had a chance to meet him. But incoming Buccaneer defenseman Connor Varley took a weight off his shoulder by committing to Penn State University, where he'll be a member of their new Division I hockey program, which will start up not this season but the following season. Connor Varley will be a Buccaneer this upcoming season, as we noted in a press release a couple weeks back. He's a Pennsylvania native and one of a number of USHL players that are being soaked up by the Penn State Nittany Lions. Penn State is coming right into the USHL and gobbling up a lot of USHL talent right away as they'll be a part of that brand new Big Ten Hockey Conference. A Big Ten Hockey Conference, by the way, that has started splits, fractures, fixtures, if you will, throughout the entire collegiate hockey scene, but that's a debate for another day. Uh, Penn State, though, finally getting Division One hockey, what had been rumored, speculated, dreamed of for years, finally happening. And Connor Varley, a Pennsylvania native, will be a part of Penn State uh, coming up either at the start of next season or two years down the road. Uh, Connor will, though, be with the Buccaneers this season as uh, he will get an opportunity to perform in front of you, the fans, coming up this year. Well, fans, again, we know when the first games are for the Des Moines Buccaneers. That first home game, and the first game, in fact, of the 2011-2012 season, Saturday, October 1st, against the Fargo Force. It'll be a 7.05 drop of the puck at Buccaneer Arena. University of Iowa does not play any football that day. I think Iowa State plays a very early game. So the Buccaneers pretty much have everything to their, to their own that night so fans make plans right now to be out here saturday october 1st and again if you've pulled up this broadcast on the internet you're probably already planning on tailgating that evening so come on out early we'll be happy to see you again at buccaneer arena on saturday october 1st as the buccaneers take on fargo and of course the 29 games after that but before we get to that there's still news and notes and preparations for that upcoming season and we'll be able to update you on all of that again in two weeks another edition of bucks talk coming up in two weeks you can find it right here at buckshockey.com of course that's assuming i get a chance to get some sleep with the newborn but again that's a that's a that's a problem for me not necessarily your problem so again buccaneer schedule is out Huge weight off everyone's shoulder. Great schedule. Great job done by the league, by the way, in making in making it a very good schedule, limiting the number of midweek games. So a great job done by the league, as Brant noted. It came out later than everybody would have wanted it to, but at least they got it right. There's nothing worse than something comes in late and it's not good. This didn't come in necessarily as early as anybody had wanted it to, but it came out very good for a lot of teams, especially for your Des Moines Buccaneers. Buccaneers have the locker room renovations going on. Another step for this organization as this team looks to kick things up a notch once again. And, of course, the news on Danny O'Donoghue and newbie Connor Farley. Thank you very much for following us this week. We'll talk to you again in two weeks. Until then, fans, there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. Take care, everyone.